Hi guys, uh, I am live here with Kelly Brogan from New York at King's College London. Um, Kelly has come over for the very first time to the UK yeah, and time. she's been speaking all day to members of the public who frankly, it's very clear, have been inspired uh, by your book and by a lot of your teachings online, Kelly. So yeah, thank you for coming over. It's a huge privilege for us to have you here. Uh, I know tomorrow there's a lot of doctors and nutritional therapists that are going to come and try and learn some take-homes from you as to how to apply your principles in their own practice. Um, what's it like for you coming over to a different country and having so many people coming to see you speak? Well, you're obviously the highlight, but there, <laughs> it, it's interesting to me, actually we were talking about this, to, to understand how uh, many assumptions I make about what people know and don't know about nutritional medicine and the role of nutrition in psychiatric illness specifically. I find even there are practitioners who are in the alternative and holistic realm who I would think would apply these same principles to their quote unquote psychiatric patients who have never thought to do that. So yeah. I'm excited to sort of learn about how much there is to how, spread the word, how much it's needed. Well, Kelly, that's really interesting. Um, one thing I'm going to do this time actually is if you guys are watching, please, uh, if you've got any questions for us, just you know, put them in. I think there's a Joanne basket there. Uh, hi Joanne, uh, you're a big fan of your work, I can see that Kelly. Um, so yeah, any questions please do ask us, we'll try and uh, keep them, I'll try and ask Kelly for you. But Kelly, I think a key question for me is, a lot of the public, a lot of practitioners are going to ask, well, how does what I eat yeah. affect my brain? And um, maybe you could share some of your thoughts totally. on that. So I, if you have about six hours, I'll just get started. <laughs> and you can, we've been sort of convinced of this model, right, where the, the it's a head up, body down phenomenon. Yeah. And this is psychiatry and this is the rest of medicine. And actually it's been about 20 years since there has been science, it's actually typically goes by the term psychoneuroimmunology, which suggests that all of this is connected. And the most powerful point of entry into this web of interconnected systems is nutrition. Yeah. And we even have published literature, dramatic cases, you know, of, of a woman who was a 27-year vegetarian, for example, who um, developed a B12 deficiency so severe that she became psychotically depressed and completely recovered, of course, after she was treated with antipsychotics and electroconvulsive therapy, completely recovered when she was injected two times with B12. Two times? And what, what was her serum B12 level, Kelly? It was just below 200, just below 197. Wow, uh. which is considered normal by you know by some metrics. In, in this one, it was just below normal, and so it's just one instance of how a single nutrient deficiency and no nutrient operates in isolation, obviously, but how a single nutrient deficiency can result in what we are calling a psychiatric syndrome, and treating with psychiatric medications, of course about which I've developed a lot of concerns, having formerly believed they were the only answer. Sure. And I think it's important for people uh, who are not familiar with your work, you are a conventionally trained psychiatrist, Ivy League trained, you know, practicing, um, prescribing medications in the past for these kind of brain problems. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. You've you changed your practice from what yes. I can tell. Yes, and I absolutely used to believe that these medications were not only necessary, but really the only responsible option. Uh, for anyone to in engage with regard to treatment of any psychiatric pathology. And um, many years ago now, I put down my prescription pad and I no longer prescribe under any circumstances. I do a lot of medication tapers and the outcomes that I achieve through nutritional medicine blow out of the water anything I even thought was possible with medications. Right. And that's, you know, a complicated story, but it's compelling. We have to really do a lot of myth busting in this arena. Yeah, Kelly, I mean, a lot of your viewpoint is um, that you talk about in your book that I've seen online. I very much share that. Yeah. Um, but what I find fascinating about uh, what you just said about B12, and when I, when I sort of post yesterday that I was going to talk to you, a lot of people kept asking me about B12. And mm -hmm. um, in the UK, we've got very similar, similar laboratory reference ranges that you have in the US. It's roughly 150 to 600 is deemed normal. Um, and I routinely have uh, seen many of my colleagues report 150, 155, 160 as normal. Mm. Uh, and I also have seen dramatic changes in people's cognitive function, their muscle pains, all kinds of things when you correct or you optimize their B12. And I think there's this whole concept in conventional medicine that 
things are very binary, things are very black and I white, you know, yeah. see the normal or abnormal, yes. but what about the shades of gray in between? Right. And, and you're normal, 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 normal until the day you're abnormal, right? There's no continuum, there's no, what we know is, is called long latency of disease, which is that this has been accumulating for a long time yeah. before you actually present to a doctor with symptoms. So why not intervene early, fortify what we know to be the native resiliency of the body, and forget about just waiting until you get a diagnosis or, or a disease. Yeah. And, and our current system is not set up. It's only set up to detect diseases. So any nutrient that you're checking by blood, the reference ranges are for what we call gross pathology, right? Yeah. So it's for when you're really, really sick and you even have organ damage related to a nutrient deficiency. It's not at all to optimize, it's not to prevent, and it's not to engage in the, this complex type of treatment where we're doing a whole bunch of things at once. Yeah, what's interesting, Kelly, on, on the B12, I've, um, I've been going out to San Francisco quite a lot to talk to Professor Dale Bredesen, who has been uh, reversing mild to moderate cognitive decline in patients with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Yes. And he looks at multiple metabolic parameters in the body exactly, and, and optimizes all yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and the analogy he uses is if there's 36 holes on the roof, why plug just one of them? Yes. And I think it's a great analogy. And actually for him, serum B12, although I think we'd both probably accept that it's not the most accurate marker of B12 levels, but at the same time, it's cheap to do. It's very readily available to people. Um, Professor Bredesen likes to see his serum B12 level B12 levels above 700. Um, yeah, I would so. say 600. That's what I use, and I use injection below that just because I feel it's very low risk, and it's potentially extremely high yield. And I still have this mentality, like my old doctor mentality, of wanting results quickly. So I'm yeah. a bit of an impatient person by nature, and so I, I would agree. His work is remarkable because there's so few people using multiple variables in the research setting to approximate what we are doing in lifestyle medicine, which is really very difficult to study in, in the trial. I, I think this setting. is the problem, actually, and um, I'm involved with bringing Professor Bredesen's trial um, over to the UK and hope, hopefully going to run the, the uh, preclinical pilots here. But one of the challenges is how do you, um, you know, you, the conventional way of proving treatments is the right. RCT, the randomized controlled trial, which works very well for drug therapies. You know, 50 patients take the drug, 50 patients don't. What's the outcome? But when you're changing maybe six, seven, eight, nine variables, it, it, it becomes a bit more challenging to show people that there has been a benefit, at least in the conventional ways. And so but I, I think that's a challenge, but also one of the things we're going to have to overcome if we are going to persuade the masses right. that actually uh, this is the way to treat people. Kelly, as a conventional psychiatrist in the past, was there a turning point for you when you suddenly, I don't know, saw the light or thought, I need to change my practice. Yes. So it's a confluence of factors because I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis having never had a health problem in my life. And through the help of a naturopath, I was able to put that into remission. A lot of red flags were raised for me because not only did I never learn in my conventional training that you could ever put a chronic autoimmune disorder into remission, but I also never learned that nutrition had anything to do with anything other than something you mentioned to patients on the way out the door, maybe stop drinking soda if you want. Yeah. So that, and then I read a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic which essentially helped me to understand that the published literature suggests that actually treating quote unquote mental illness with psychiatric medication results in worse long-term outcomes than if you didn't treat at all. Wow. That's pretty provocative, you know, for somebody who really believed these medications were the right way to yeah. approach a patient. And so once I read that, I had to begin to do my own investigating and to shed everything that I had learned from my training and to learn it for myself based on the published literature. And so that's essentially what I did. And it convinced me that the effects are largely misunderstood and overplayed uh, when it comes to really all psychiatric medications and that the risks are completely suppressed, that, that the average patient has no idea about the risks of psychiatric medication from uh, induction of homicidal and suicidal violence all the way to total dependency where coming off medication is nearly impossible. These are things I wish I had known before I started prescribing and I'm sure my patients wish they had known. And so, you know, that's all its own entity, but then when we consider we have a much more effective, safe, inexpensive yeah. treatment protocol in lifestyle medicine to reverse all of these potential causes, whether it's thyroid dysfunction, blood sugar instability, medication side effects, we can reverse all of these things that are being labeled as psychiatric because yeah. your doctor unfortunately doesn't probably know the way I didn't how to look at the root cause of potentially what you're coming in for. So it, it really is a problem that 
is solved already. Like we have the answers we need already. Yeah, we do. And I think one thing you said there, Kelly, really strikes me. Um, and really it's at the heart of what has changed me and the way I practice medicine. And it's, I, I think this whole risk-benefit ratio, when, when we're assessing any treatment, whether it's nutrition, uh, and let's say I would argue that the benefits are very, very high and the risks are almost zero. Right. Uh, but when we're assessing a drug, for example, it always has struck me that an antidepressant has, and this is not a conspiracy, this is published in, uh, we, we use something called the BNF, the British National Formula. It says clearly, it, it's a rare side effect, but it increases your risk of suicide. Now, right. I find it remarkable that these drugs are being prescribed with the frequency that they are, when a documented side effect is right. it can increase your risk of suicide. I think we have to sometimes take a step back and go, hold on a minute, maybe we should try safer interventions first. First do, no, it's first do no harm, it's the doctor's oath. And you know, you could be convinced out of desperation um, that you are probably not somebody who's gonna deal with that side effect, it's vanishingly rare. But the truth is we don't know. We don't have a means of saying, you're totally safe, you know, you can take this and you sh probably shouldn't. We don't have what we call risk stratification tools. No. And so we need to proceed through the path of, of least harm first. Yeah. And if I, you know, any prescribing psychiatrist will tell you take six to eight weeks for the medications yeah. to work, right? So all I ask for is a, a month, <laughs> you know, so give me a month and I can virtually guarantee a shift in, in your symptoms if you are committed and you actually believe that this is, you know, the way for you. Those are important pieces. Um, but do, do you think that's um, a problem? Someone, uh, I think Charlie said to me on, on Facebook before, she said, um, is it hard with this group of patients, so obviously you're a psychiatrist, so you may see the majority of your patients, I'm guessing, have got some form of mental health diagnosis. Yes. And the changes you're asking them to make, whether it's nutrition, lifestyle, sleep, mm -hmm. uh, stress, uh, is this a particular subgroup of patients that are more resistant to that change because they're doing so badly with their health? Uh, do you, I mean, It's a great question. I get this all the time, right, because a lot of my critics suggest that I just treat the worried well, right? Yeah. So I just treat people who are interested in fine-tuning their diet and getting into bikinis for the summer. I don't know yeah. what they think. But the truth is that I am often the last stop, as so many of us are, right? So that the patients who were not helped by conventional treatment, and sometimes not even helped by other alternative options, who end up in my office very clinically symptomatic, I find that the more motivated patients are, as long as they fundamentally are on my page in terms yeah. of the belief that the body has the capacity to heal itself and that the symptoms are actually a message and it's something we have to investigate. Uh, as long as they're on my page with that, they are the most motivated patients out of all of mine. These patients who can barely get out of bed, some of them have 24-hour home health aids because they can't even function. They you know, take this prescription and run with it. And they do so because they're desperate, right? So I actually find it's, it's contrary to what you would intuit to be the case that the more sick a patient is, the more motivated they are to actually comply. It's not that difficult, right. but it does require support. Support from a clinician, hopefully, maybe, but really support from a greater community. Yeah, you may, you may be underestimating the, the role that you have yourself, Kelly. I'm sure when you're with a patient, you're very engaging and very... Um, inspiring to that person in front of you and I certainly feel I have reflected a lot on our role as healthcare professionals and as medical doctors and I really do feel that our job is especially these days with the burden of chronic disease our job is to inspire patients uh, you know I want when my patient has left my room then to feel motivated inspired and go yeah you know what I am going to try this because I genuinely believe give it two weeks give it three weeks you will start to feel the difference which will then engage you to continue. Totally, you have uh, to have that experience because no amount of you know slides and books and conversation and science exchange is ever going to convince anyone of anything. I really no. believe that you have to have the experience for yourself, and maybe you have to be inspired to commit. But those are the only ingredients, and a lot of my inspiration comes not only from my own healing experience, but also uh, from my outcomes now over years with patients where I. I passionately believe that this is really simple, but it's a matter of committing to it. I think yeah. the commitment piece, sometimes you have to walk the walk before you actually believe that you know you deserve it, right? It's like almost like a self-love surrogate. You have to commit to a discipline and then you can feel the results and the results then fuel the future. Absolutely, and I think a big problem I find, and I actually think it's probably a bigger problem in, in the United States than it is here, because you have this, what, what we, we we find remarkable that you can 
directly advertise to your consumer yes, yes. in the United States. I'm, I'm sort of mesmerized every time I go to America and I switch on the television in the hotel room. I, I see One adverts. After another, I know. Yeah, and, and I think for Europeans, we find it very bizarre that that is allowed first of all. It feels wrong, right? But, yeah. but even here, without that, um, people from the press or from the internet have been educated to believing that their depression is a chemical imbalance That's in right. their brain. And sometimes I find that the first part of the conversation is actually helping them understand that that's not true. That's not true. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and it's not true based on the published literature. I mean, I scoured it, and in 60 years of published literature, there's not a single case that validates what's called the chemical imbalance theory or the serotonin theory of depression. You know, and believe me, pharmaceutical industry has been trying to, to come up with a way <laughs> to validate this. And, it, and to the extent that actually the primary research has now shifted away from it. And they're looking more at considering depression a lot like we consider other chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmunity, cancer, as something driven by inflammation. What's inflammation? It's just a message on the part of the body that there's a mismatch. There's a mismatch with your lifestyle, and that involves necessarily your diet, your stress level, your sleep, your movement, sun exposure, it's a mismatch and your body is trying to adapt. It's doing what it does best, which is to tell you that you're you're out of whack. And so it's, it's relatively simple to reverse once you just get the ingredients involved that send the body that signal of safety. And I think people sometimes don't realize or underestimate how potentially simple totally. it can be. I remember just about a month ago or so, I mean, I know your book came out earlier this year and, you know, huge congratulations that you. you made a New York Times bestseller list. Um, and really, for those of you who have not read Kelly's book of mine, if you're in it, it absolutely is a fantastic read, one of the best books I've read in the past few years, uh, without question. Um, but a study came out after the publication of your book from King's, I think it's King's College London, That's actually, right. and we're, we're right here. Um, and for me, the most striking part about the conclusion was that if you take a subgroup of patients with diagnosed depression yes. and if one subset has a high amount of inflammation in their body, they said, I think with 100% certainty that you would not respond yes, that's to right. an antidepressant. It's treatment resistant. Yeah. yeah, but it's remarkable because um, it kind of makes sense though, really, doesn't it? If you've got a lot of inflammation in your body, why take a drug that's designed to raise a chemical in your brain? <laughs> right. uh, you know, right. uh, and um, right. so... You know, the, the research keeps coming. Um, and that's why the analogy that we write, we use in functional medicine is sort of like you could take a Tylenol if you have a piece of glass in your foot, but it's probably going to serve you better just to take the piece of glass out and, yeah. and not just try and suppress and manage and hope for the best that you can, you know, get rid of these symptoms. It's always going to be um, the path of least resistance, actually, even if it seems like the path of more resistance to engage the root cause resolution. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, Kelly, uh, it's just a few more things I wanted to cover. I, I can see that there's a lot of comments there. There's a Joanne Basket. Hi, Joanne. Um, you've been asking a lot about thyroid, I think, in B12. That's coming up a lot. How do you cure thyroid disease? It's a big question. Yes, um, yes, yes, you know, what are your optimal B12 levels? Um, so what comes to that, there's people, I know there's, a, there's Drew, who we know, I think, from California. Hi, Drew. Um, so yeah, maybe we could talk about, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do B12 and thyroid, but also I really want to talk about blood sugar because mm -hmm. I think people conceptually understand, oh, type 2 diabetes, you know, I need to look after my blood sugar. But actually, it's critical with mental health problems, isn't That's it? Right. Yes. I would say, you know, probably the, the top three considerations if, if you've been diagnosed with a psychiatric illness of some kind, if you know someone who has, um, to investigate our, our blood sugar, our thyroid instability, much of which, if not all of which, is autoimmune in nature, so your body attacking your own thyroid. And then there's a big one, which is medication-induced um, psychiatric symptoms. So the blood sugar one is huge. In my practice, I treat women, and in, in my practice, most of these women have what's called reactive hypoglycemia, yeah. right, which is this roller coaster up and down of your blood sugar throughout the day, uh, most notorious for, you know, symptoms that are, are sort of dubbed feeling hangry, right, so irritable, um, tired, uh, sometimes headachy, nauseous. And you can be diagnosed with anything from ADHD to chronic fatigue to panic attacks to depression. And all that could be going on is you have imbalanced blood sugar. Yeah. So often I will make a simple recommendation of a high natural fat diet and it is reversed in a week, sometimes 10 days. And you never had a psychiatric problem, right? Your problem is fundamentally endocrine in nature. So that's a huge one. And it's not blood sugar in the, you know, these are patients who look 
healthy and thin young women. They don't fit the profile of like a diabetic, right? And Kelly, I think Deborah's saying the exact same thing. Uh, hi, Deborah. I quit sugar and grains and my monthly severe depression practically disappeared. I mean, there yeah. you go. There you go. So it's, it's hard to connect those dots because we're still thinking that psychiatry and depression is up here. Um, but once we begin to understand the connection between hormones, the inflammatory immune system, and the gut, it all begins to make sense. And then we don't need to have complex interventions. We have simple interventions that have complex effects. So that, I would say, thyroid is you know close to my heart, obviously, because as I mentioned, I put my own Hashimoto's into remission through basic principles of lifestyle medicine. Um, so you, that's amazing that you actually, yeah, to yourself, I mean, that's I had the experience, yeah. absolutely put, put it Put, put her own Hashimoto's into remission. I think that hopefully is very inspiring right. for a lot of people oh, watching. It's, it's actually one of the easiest of all autoimmune disorders to put into remission. It's totally mm -hmm. doable. Um, and it's doable through things like gluten and dairy elimination, blood sugar stabilization. Uh, but it's important to remember that autoimmune thyroid masquerades, again, as all sorts of psychiatric pathology. So from postpartum depression, even postpartum psychosis, can be literally just an autoimmune condition that hasn't been diagnosed, all the way to panic attacks and chronic depression, which is long-term you know, uh, glandular damage from Hashimoto's. All of it, amazingly, I find, is still recoverable. Whether or not you can stop taking hormone is always a personalized question. Sure. But putting your antibodies into remission and clinically feeling better is totally doable. And then the medication piece is things that are commonly prescribed or over-the-counter, acid-blocking drugs, cholesterol medications, uh, birth control is a big one. Yeah. You know, I took it for 12 years. I think it's hugely problematic. Uh, antibiotics, even Tylenol and, um, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory medications that people use for headaches. And uh, these are for, for people watching the UK. Yeah, that's know, that's uh, paracetamol and ibuprofen, right. uh, which I think you guys call Tylenol. Uh, and Motrin, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. So all of these have documented effects on the immune system and or specific psychiatric effects that you may not be made aware of from your prescriber. And so those are going to be the first things I want you to think of if you're ever struggling with symptoms or encountering a diagnosis, let alone a prescription. Yeah, well, that's great. Kelly, just to finish off that, I mean, there's, um, I think, judging from the engagement, people are finding this very useful. I mean, I would highlight to people, Kelly has got a fantastic uh, website and a Facebook um, page where there's a lots of really, really good quality, high quality blogs. Um, so if you guys want to learn more, I think certainly that would be where I would point you to go. Um, the last question I had actually is something that came up in the Q&A just now actually with the public who have come to watch you and it's this whole concept of vegetarians. Yes, yes, yes. And um, I, I know you used to be an ethical vegetarian and it's been quite a big thing for you I think to, to initially to change that, that you have found by introducing animal products that it's improved your own health? No question. It's, um, it's been a tough thing for me to wrap my mind and actually my heart around, which is that 100% of my patients thus far who struggle with depression specifically, um, so struggling with other issues may be a more nuanced conversation, but have gotten better with the inclusion of not only animal foods, but specifically red meat. So lamb, beef, bison, these things, always from pastured sources, always completely grass-fed and organic, obviously. I hope that's obvious. Um, but that I well, have... Well, actually, Kelly, I'm, I'm just going to, on that point, I know, say... I, I just no, no, I agree. I think to, um, to many people it is obvious, but as we were talking about at lunch, is yes. that I think sometimes when we deal with uh, educated consumers and we, you know, in our own social media world, a lot of people are already invested in this way of thinking, but there's many people out there who actually Don't have got, yeah, yeah, I really do, yeah. I, and I, I realize that like more and more, so I think we have to constantly remind ourselves that people out there, to a lot of people, this is brand new information. Yes, so suffice it to say that an animal who is raised being fed genetically modified uh, herbicide saturated grain standing in its own feces pumped with antibiotics and growth hormone never seeing you know the sunlight or grass under its feet is not something you ever want to consume frankly under any circumstances period from ethical considerations to nutrition considerations because of course we now understand that those animals actually are made up of different nutrients yeah. than they would otherwise be if they ate their natural diet so I do obviously recommend consciousness around sourcing, but I've found that a red meat inclusive diet is instrumental, you know, for my patient's recovery. And 
when we are talking about preferences or understanding based on media over the past 60 years about saturated fat being dangerous, red meat clogging your arteries, and general uh, assumptions that a vegetarian diet is always a healthier diet, um, I encourage people to consider a one-month trial of this type of a more, we call it ancestral <laughs> template. Sure. Uh, it's worth doing. It's worth doing just to give yourself your own data and information on how you feel because if it's right for you, you'll know within a month. If it's an ethical... Yeah, you know, I think Su Susan there is saying that it still makes her gag. Have you got any alternatives? And that's... That's challenging, isn't it, for people when they when they have that ethical reason to be vegetarian, and I, I fully respect that, as totally. I'm sure you do. Um, but it, it it can be tricky sometimes. It can, and, and sometimes you know the the you have to listen to that preference. Um, but sometimes you might want to see how you feel getting around it. So I do use um, hydrolyzed collagen, you know, with my patients. It's something you can get online these days. You put that in your smoothie, don't you? Yeah, uh, exactly. I posted a link to that yesterday. There's a really good smoothie that you make. Yeah, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to get. All it is, it's like brown, it's bone broth, basically. It's bone broth in powdered form, tasteless form. Um, or you can take grass-fed beef liver capsules. And, yeah, you know, sure. It's a way to sort of mitigate some of the deficiencies you might be encountering not eating red meat. But sometimes you do want to listen to that. Sometimes it does mean that it's not right for you to eat it. If you really have a deep bodily signal yeah. um, of revulsion, then you do need to listen. I never push past that. But if it's a mind thing, it's worth, uh, it's worth getting past. And sometimes you need to ease into it. Some of my patients take about a month to just even think about it, consider it, you know, hold this idea in their mind's eye, and then they feel ready. And then actually they encounter a craving for it, which yeah. is interesting. I've heard that a lot. It's very, as, as you said before, there are many people on the internet who've got these stories that they were vegetarian or vegan. So many, they, yeah. they change their lifestyle, they change what they put into their diets and their health improves. Now, I must say that as a doctor, I do believe that most people benefit from having some animal products in their diets. Uh, having said that, two nights ago, I watched Cowspiracy with my wife, and, <laughs> and it, it, it's really actually made me think a lot since then, because um, obviously I don't know, I know it's getting quite noisy here, lots of people probably come to watch you, Kelly. Um, but, um, well, there's no one diet for everyone. Yeah, there is no that's one diet. Critical, yeah. That's the critical piece, so, you know, researchers, in, in the natural world, like Weston Price helped us understand that that there are many, many ways to health. There are many, many diets um, that can, you, through which you can achieve health. You know, none of the traditional diets that he explored, for example, in the early 1900s, were vegetarian. All of them included some form of animal food, whether it was eggs or dairy sure. or a range of animal products. But Nonetheless, if, if you're thriving on a vegan diet, then, then do your thing. But if you're if you're symptomatic, particularly if your symptoms are in uh, the depression, anxiety arena, I do think it's worth a try. Sure. Well, look, Kelly, I really appreciate your time. Um, guys, look, it's uh, Kelly is here in London tomorrow as well. If any of you are healthcare professionals, there are, I believe, some tickets, very few, available for tomorrow to watch Kelly speak in King's College London. Um, I'm going to try and do a Facebook Live tomorrow afternoon, so we're going to have a panel discussion between myself, Kelly, uh, Dr. Tamsin Lewis, and also Dr. Ian Panja from BBC World is coming to moderate that for us. Um, so you can press actually on a subscribe button at the bottom there. If you press that, then it, you will be alerted as to when that's coming on. I think it's going to be around 3 p.m. UK time tomorrow, so uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, or it was that 7 a.m. Pacific in the States. So um, yeah, if you guys want to tune in tomorrow, then hopefully uh, let us know, ask any more questions, and we'll see if we can get Kelly to answer them for you. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. So fun. Thank you, everyone.